this is a very worrying situation where every sector of the economy, including the hospitality sector, is short of workforce and labor and needs to recruit people. And we need to bring them in from abroad. Skilling people domestically takes time. But the deal with the government after we left the European Union and the points-based system was if there are shortages in sectors, then the shortage occupation list would be activated and we'd be able to bring in the workforce to require from around the world. And it's every sector, whether it's agricultural workers, hospitality, technology, let alone the health service, there are shortages everywhere. And what is so misleading, and nobody points this out, is the net migration figure includes international students. International students are not immigrants. Technically, they're counted as immigrants because anyone who stays for one year, a one-year master's student is counted as an immigrant, but other countries like America and Australia treat them as temporary migrants and exclude them from the figures. If you take international students out of the net migration figure, this figure of 670,000, 750,000 gets reduced by hundreds of thousands. People don't realize that. And then suddenly it's not as scary a figure as is being made out to, and the government just will not listen to this. I brought this up in the House of Lords many, many times, and they were refusing to take out students from the net migration figures. And if you do that, you could then bring in the workforce that every sector in this economy desperately needs. I take the point, your point on the student figures, but as you say, it will reduce by a few hundred thousand. It's still an awful long way from the kind of tens of thousands that we were promised by David Cameron all those many moons ago. Um, what do you make of the specific policy to exclude the dependents uh, of care workers, for example? Uh, because that's something that many Conservative MPs think is rather a good thing because it will help relieve pressure on public services. If you exclude dependents for something like the care sector, and the care sector is the Cinderella sector uh, in the whole health area, it's very difficult to recruit staff anyway. They don't get paid very much. And if you stop them bringing in their dependents, you're going to again create an acute shortage for uh, an area that is already struggling. The hospitality sector, dependents don't matter as much, but you need a threshold of 40,000 pounds, nearly 40,000 pounds is gonna make it unaffordable for the hospitality sector my business, we supply 7,000 restaurants. They're already fighting with their hands tied behind their backs with COVID and with the Ukraine war and the cost of living crisis, one thing after another, business rates being one of the highest in Europe, and now you can't recruit people that you need. I'm sorry, good immigration has been good for this country. We wouldn't be the sixth largest economy in the world without the 15% ethnic minorities who are now reaching the very top, let alone the prime minister of this country. Why are we hampering good immigration when we should be focusing on the illegal immigration that everyone agrees needs to be stopped and they should be making every effort to do that? Don't stop the good immigration, let alone harm international students that bring in 42 billion pounds to this economy and are one of our strongest elements of soft power. In the whole world as we speak, along with America, half the world's leaders have been educated at British or American universities with the rest of the countries in the world making up the other 50%. That's how powerful it is. It's priceless. We should be appreciating it, not hampering it. What do you think is going on then, it, it, taking what you uh, say uh, on, on merit? Do you think that the Prime Minister just doesn't get business or do you think that he's playing to the gallery, trying to play politics instead? There is this attitude and impression, and it goes back to Brexit. One of the main reasons that Brexit happened in 2016 was in 2015, you have the awful immigration coming over from the crisis in the Middle East and the tragedies in the Mediterranean and Angela Merkel saying that she would let in a million people. That fear of large-scale immigration is one of the fears that led to Brexit. And there's always been this fear created about immigration. Instead of talking about immigration that's good immigration, a positive light and appreciating it, that's what we should be doing. I just want to ask you about the CBI, uh, finally, uh, if I may, because obviously it has been, you know, a a difficult period, shall we say, for uh, the CBI and our city editor, Mark Kleiman, uh, reporting that you're going to be putting up subscriptions. Is this an organisation under pressure? The CBI has been through a very, very difficult time since March this year. That is absolutely open knowledge. We've had an extraordinary challenging time. I was president for two years until June 2022. And as a tradition is, I've stayed on on the board as vice president uh, until now. I'm still on the board until late this week when I'll be stepping down. All I can say is through this challenging period, the CBI has made huge reforms and is now very much back on a good footing financially. Membership is, is the members who suspended, have been rejoining. A government engagement has started. We had a major conference where the chancellor spoke, the shadow business secretary spoke. So government engagement now is, is on as before. 
So the CBI is getting back to being the preeminent business organization in this country and the voice of British business, not just in the UK, but on the global stage as well. And I'm very uh, relieved and happy uh, that I'm stepping down from the board at a time when it's in a good, strong position going forward with a secure future.